paper. Uh, so we have uh, Luana Zaccaria is going to present a paper from Patriarchy to Partnership, Gender Equality and Household Finance. Uh, so I see the slides are already on and yeah. the discussion is going to be, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, discussion Good. is going to be Anastasia Girshina. You have right. 20 minutes. Thank you very much to the organizers and to the audience for uh, uh, attending the session. The paper that I'm presenting today uh, very nicely relates to the paper that, was, that Amit just presented. Uh, and it examines the, relations, the relationship between gender equality, or if you want, gender norms in the domestic context, and uh, household finance, in particular for what concerns uh, uh, financial investment. But let me start with the uh, a little uh, anecdotal evidence uh, showing that women generally are less engaged than men uh, or than their partners uh, in uh, financial management. Uh, here you see a typical household to-do list uh, uh, based on the popular responses uh, on categories of money chores, so of my financial my management tasks, according to a survey that was conducted in 2019 in the UK. As you can see, the male spouses typically are in charge of investments, pensions, personal loans, so important, relevant, consequential decision making, while females are typically left with day-to-day -day spending decision, in general, short-term uh, financial decision. Very few decisions are also taken jointly. So these results are confirmed by other surveys taken, for example, in the United States, and they suggest that financial decision making is typically considered men's task within a household, a little bit like domestic work is considered a female task. Right, so we can look at this pattern, or this empirical patterns, pa uh, pattern in division of labor within the, uh, the household as either the result of optimal specialization based on comparative advantage, Basically, we're, we're arguing here that men are in general better in uh, um, money issues than, than females, and that's why they're in charge um, of uh, financial decision making. Or else, uh, we can think of this empirical pattern as arising from social norms that, dict that dictates uh, gender roles. Um, social norms, for example, uh, uh, see men as the, 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 the ones in charge of saying, for example, uh, changing a broken light bulb and, and women in charge of, uh, of uh, doing the dishes, for example. Now, these two uh, interpretations of these empirical facts obviously uh, have, uh, have very different implications in terms of uh, uh, household um, welfare, right? Because if the decision-making process uh, systematically excludes women regardless of their abilities, then the overall efficiency may be compromised. In other words, uh, if men are in charge of financial decision making by virtue of their gender and not because of any comparative advantage, then the decision, the financial decision that will arise will clearly be uh, suboptimal. So to rephrase and reiterate our questions, we ask in this paper, what are the effects of different gender norms on household finance? And in particular, we look at outcomes such as investments and returns in financial assets. Now, the first issue in this, uh, uh, in this investigation is obviously how to measure gender norms. Our starting point is uh, uh, data on household headship in the Italian Household Survey of Income and Wealth. In particular, in this survey, uh, the households are, are asked to declare who is the household head, uh, which is defined as the person in charge or more knowledgeable of families' uh, economic matters. Now, our data show that the proportion of households that were headed by females uh, increased in a, in a, at a very uh, sustained pace in the last 30 years. And in particular, it was basically zero in the years in between the mid 70s and the 90s, and then it started increasing uh, um, at the beginning of the 90s. Now, to be clear here, we are only using uh, in our sample households that comprises um, um, two spouses or, or a cohabiting couple or married couple. So we exclude, we exclude all households that have different living arrangements such as um, uh, single parents, for example. Now what's behind this trend? But clearly there's uh, several uh, uh, usual suspects. So the education gap between the female spouse and the male spouse closed over the last uh, uh, 30 years. Uh, it is also true that women uh, started uh, increasingly participating the, uh, in the labor um, 
uh, in the labor force. Here we have the proportion of, of housewives over the active female pop population plotted. And also conditional on participating, participating in the labor force, the earnings uh, of, uh, of women increased more and more relative to the, to the earnings of their male spouses. So one can argue that this increase, uh, uh, the, so the, this trend in female emancipation in the, in the household is related to measures of comparative advantage, right? So as women become more educated, they participate more in the labor force, they're more familiar with market forces, uh, then they become better equipped uh, uh, for making financial uh, or economic decisions. So, however, and this is crucial for our paper, uh, this uh, measures of comparative advantage relate uh, in, uh, uh, to female headship in different ways depending on the social context. And in particular, these variables have different effects across different cohorts and regions. And let me show you an example of that. Here I'm plotting the um, average female headship uh, among households uh, on the y-axis and on the x-axis uh, I plot the, there's the, uh, we have the wife to husband earning ratio. And we, we present this plot for both the cohort born around 1924 and the cohort born around 1969. Now the relationship is, is increasing and that's intuitive, right? The more she earns, the more likely she is to be in charge of economic decision making. However, if you look at the cohort of 1969, a woman that earns pretty much the same income as uh, her husband is 50% likely to, uh, to be in charge of, of to be de declared as the one in charge of, of economic decision making. Now the situation is very different for the cohort of 1924, where this probability is less than 25%. Similarly, we have regions that show, um, uh, that appear to be much more progressive across all of the cohorts, such as Sardinia, plotted on the, on the right hand side, uh, versus Calabria, where Again, the same probability of being in charge for a woman that earns the same, um, the same income as her husband is uh, around 20%. So we can uh, uh, conclude that the allocation of economic decision-making power depends both on comparative advantage, which can be measured at the household level, and on environmental factors, which can be defined at the cohort and region level. Now to rationalize this finding, uh, we, propose a, uh, we propose a model of uh, uh, social conformism similar, similar to Akerlof from 1997, where the households decide who between the husband and wife is the decision maker um, uh, within the family. And the decision is based on um, considerations based on uh, uh, comparative advantage or tradition, whereby the importance of tradition uh, is um, uh, related to the, impor the importance to conform to a local social norm, which, which can be described by the behavior of older cohorts in the same region. So implicitly, we are assuming that the uh, transmission of social norms happen happens uh, uh, through imitation of role models, such as my neighbors, my parents, my relatives, uh, who live in, in, a, in, a, in a close proximity. Now, the model consists in a household that has to assign headship to spouse G, which takes value one or zero, depending on whether the spouse is the female or the male spouse, um, has to maximize a utility function that can be di divided in two, uh, in two components. One component is what we call the intrinsic utility, which depends simply on the, say, the comparative advantage of spouse G, say, for example, uh, his or her uh, education. Uh, and the second term accounts for households' desire to conform to a certain, certain social norms, which we call G bar Z, uh, that prevails in community Z. And beta, uh, in this uh, utility uh, function, measures the intensity of the discomfort caused by not conforming to predominant gen gender roles. So it, it measures the importance of, traditions vers of tradition versus efficiency in this choice. Uh, now, with, uh, with uh, a few simple additional uh, uh, assumptions, we can express the probability of observing uh, uh, female headship uh, as a function of the difference in, uh, say, comparative advantage between the husband and the wife in, in that ho uh, household I, plus a component which depends on environmental factors, CZ, we, we call CZ, 
uh, which is uh, um, uh, measured at the cohort and region level, but not at the individual household uh, level. This component is um, uh, uh, proportional both to the inherited social norm and the importance of tradition. Now, I will not dwell for too long on this model, which is fairly simple, uh, but uh, um, I, I just wanted to point out that the model has two main functions. One is to provide the uh, basis for the identification of uh, uh, gender, not empirical identification through cohort and region variation of headship. And the second role, which we will see at the, at the, towards the end of the talk, um, is to provide us with a rationale for cultural change. Namely, changes in the importance of traditions versus, versus efficiency can affect both current and future gender norms. So based on, uh, on our, empiric, uh, on our uh, sort of theoretical model, we would build an empirical strategy with, which consists in two steps. The first one is to measure gender norms. And we do so with a linear probability model where G uh, takes value one if the household uh, I in community Z uh, is uh, headed by a female. Delta XI measure differences uh, between husband and wife in terms of uh, uh, comparative advantage variables. And CZ is a cohort and region fixed effect, which we use as a proxy for our equality measure. In other words, what we're saying is that uh, a community is more or less gender equal, depending on whether the household in that same community are more or less likely to systematically uh, be uh, headed by the female, everything else equal. So uh, keeping constant all of the other um, characteristics of the of the household and the spouses. Now, after we estimate this uh, this uh, effect, we use them as an explanatory variable for financial outcomes such as stock market participation. Now, before moving on to the uh, to the uh, actual uh, empirical results, let me show you a little bit what kind of variation we have in this uh, uh, explanatory variable. Here, I'm plotting uh, this fixed effect coefficient. So, our measure of uh, of uh, uh, gender equality at the cohort and region level. And as you can see, there's just a substantial variation across cohorts. So equality increases uh, for uh, younger cohorts, but there's also substantial variation across um, uh, regions within the same cohort. And to fix the idea, let's think about a, a couple born in Rome in 1942 and one born in Milan in 1970. Well, the second couple is 50% more likely everything else equal. It's 50% more likely to uh, be headed by the, by the female spouse. Now, back to our main question. Uh, we, we want to investigate whether gender norms affect financial decision making. Our outcomes are participation in the financial market, diversification and returns. And the uh, coefficient of interest is the beta coefficient. So the coefficient on our estimate of gender equality. Now, here's our main result. So here you see uh, like the dependent variable in this uh, in this regression is a dummy variable that takes value one if the household if the focal household invest in uh, any financial asset other than basically a uh, bank account so bonds stocks or mutual funds and as you can see the coefficient for our measure of equality is positive and significant it, it, its magnitude implies that uh, the difference between the, the, the couple from Milan and the, the couple from Rome is approximately a 6% higher probability of the, second, of the first couple to invest in the, in the financial market. Um, now, uh, results are robust even if we exclude households uh, older than, uh, than uh, uh, 65, 65 years. Uh, and also when we include a dummy variable for the gender of the head, right, which interestingly has no effect whatsoever on the uh, financial decision making of the family. Now, so we showed uh, in this table that uh, effectively uh, gender equality improves uh, uh, or increases participation in financial market. But of course, the next question is, is it a good thing or a bad thing now? Investing in, uh, in equities when, uh, when I consistently make the wrong picks, then might not be a good idea. So we examine financial returns. We define financial returns in two different ways, uh, like financial income over financial assets or net capital income over total assets. The difference between the two is that we, in the second one, we also include the return from uh, 
a real estate investment. And as you can see, we use both the full sample and the panel component uh, of the full sample, and the results are still significant and positive, implying that, uh, that the difference between the family in, from Milan and the family from Rome we talked about uh, is approximately between 15 basis points and 35 basis points annual return on their, uh, on their financial investment. Uh, so the results that I, that I presented suggest that more gender equality um, makes uh, financial management more efficient within the household. The mechanisms that we propose are two. The first one is the one that we already uh, discussed in uh, our model, namely that the, the, the best spouse, so the, the spouse that is better uh, suited for the task is put in charge of the financial decision making when uh, the gender norms are more equal. Uh, alternative, we can think about another mechanism, so, namely the more collaboration, the gender equality um, uh, encourages collaboration uh, um, between spouses uh, and this improves um, information and, and cost sharing and therefore it makes financial decision making more uh, efficient. Uh, for the sake of time, let me uh, uh, skip this um, and let me go back to, to the last point that we make in the paper, which is what triggers this female headship trend that we see really uh, kicks off in the, at the beginning of the 90s. And then we think about this, uh, uh, this, uh, this problem within the context of, of our um, uh, theoretical model. We said that the headship, we look at headship decision as a trade-off between efficiency and tradition. Well, then it's very likely that an economic shock, that, for example, uh, generates a drop in future expected income, uh, may increase the relative importance of efficiency over tradition, right? then which this will uh, induce households to abandon old traditional norms. Right? Now, when this shock uh, is, uh, involves an entire generation, then it can have an, an impact on future gender norms, precisely uh, using that uh, uh, imitation mechanism that I described uh, in the theoretical part. Now, uh, we identify this shock as the 1992 pension reform in Italy. These reforms reduced the future pension benefits for workers and basically reversed the uh, pension and welfare system that was created in Italy at the end of the, of the 1950s. Uh, these reforms basically shifted the burden of financial planning from the government back to private households, uh, and therefore it increased the importance of efficiency of current financial decision making. And our hypothesis is that houses will abandon social norms because the cost of complying with them exceeds the comfort from conforming with them. Now we use uh, um, um, the same uh, uh, setting as the Athanasio and Giugiavini paper of 2003. Uh, and in particular, our analysis is based on a difference in difference uh, uh, methodology, which uses, which leverages like some institutional detail of the reform itself. Uh, and, and which is the same one employed by Atanasio and Bujabini. Um, uh, and we, we do show that in fact, the, uh, uh, the households that were more affected by the reform are more likely to be headed by females just right after the, the reform. We also show that the same families, so the families that were there, uh, mm, affected by the reform after the reform are also more likely, more likely to save more and also to supply more labor. How do we read these results? Well, what we think is going on is that the reform increased the cost of misallocating decisional power and therefore reduced the incentive to comply with traditional norms. The new norm is then transmitted to subsequent generations. Okay, we found this, this, uh, this, uh, 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 this result fairly interesting because we show that this, uh, the, the pension reforms uh, have the, 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 the uh, potential to also affect sort of uh, uh, social norm and social uh, dynamics uh, on top of uh, on top of uh, uh, mere uh, financial uh, outcomes. So let me conclude with uh, with our contribution. We exploit variation in social norms across region and cohorts to build a measure of gender equality. We then show that gender equality positively affects household participation in financial markets, equity holding and asset diversification, and it also increases the share, uh, sorry, increases uh, financial returns. Um, 
we also show that with the, with the experiment, with this sort of a quasi experiment of the 1992 pension reform, we show the household abandon this social norm when the cost of complying with them is too high. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to Anastasia's comments and the audience's comments. Thank you so much, uh, Anastasia. The floor is yours. Uh, so if you can, uh, uh, exactly, perfect. Let me share the screen. Can you see? Yes, perfect. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much, first of all, Paul and Anders, for putting together such an interesting program and for inviting me to discuss this paper. It was a really stimulating read, and Luan did a, a, a very good uh, presentation of it. So let me start my discussion by, okay, here we go. Uh, let me start my discussion by and briefly summarizing the paper. So the paper builds on the Becker's theoretical framework in which he shows that the head of the family will not be defined by sex or age, but rather it will be a person who is able to maximize the welfare of all household members. Putting it in other words, it will be the person who is best suited to take financial decisions. Given this theoretical prediction, the empirical evidence um, the empirical evidence, and in particular the fact that the share of female household re, uh, increased sharply uh, from uh, 1975 all the way to 2015 might come a little bit as a surprise. Why? Because it means that if Baker is right, women somehow very fast and all of a sudden learn how to take better financial decisions or else it might suggest that uh, households, when deciding who is going to be in charge of financial decisions, are taking something else into account. And what the author suggests that uh, what else the households might take into account, it might be the social norms. So uh, the social norms shifted, and this is why there is increasingly more uh, female household heads. So what is the implication of the change in social norms and uh, of the fact that the societies became more equal? The implication is that more equal societies are able to achieve uh, better financial outcomes. Why is it important? Well, because it at odds with, with Baker, because it suggests that even at an economic cost, so households might be willing to forego higher returns in order to conform with the social norms. So uh, uh, let, me, um, let me comment on the paper, starting with the theoretical framework. So um, I'm going to, um, uh, um, to give you an intuition, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, show the, uh, a little bit more simplified version of the theoretical framework that uh, Luana and uh, Luigi have in the paper, but it will um, provide the, the intuition and, and, uh, and uh, my comment will, will hold. So um, how does the household decide who is going to be uh, a household, the gender of the household head? The household will maximize a utility consisting of, uh, of two elements. The first is the expected returns, which are written as an X, what, uh, that is household and gender specific, and um, that the authors refer to as financial skill, but I think it is more intuitive to think a bit about it as a risky share. So the risky share multiplied by the excess return, the risky assets, plus the risk free rate. So this is the utility part the household is maximizing. So where does the social norms come from? Well, the social norms come from this element here. And in particular, the social norms is the probability that the female is going to be a household head within the community. What is the community? Community here is given by the cohort and the region. So let me give you an example. So in patriarchy societies where uh, there is no female household heads, if a household decides to choose a female household head, it will be penalized by the beta. If, however, a household decides to choose a male household, uh, household head, there will be no penalty. What does it mean? It means that in patriarchy societies, the households might be willing to forego uh, some returns in order to conform with the social norms. Now, of course, in uh, the perfectly equal societies, uh, this part will not matter, and the household will choose a household head that is able to maximize the returns. So what is an implication of this model? 
Well, in order to derive a testable prediction that will drive the empirical results in the conclusion, the authors make a very strong assumption, and in particular that X, think about again as a risky share, is identically distributed across genders. Under this assumption, equality will apply, first of all, that uh, the returns in more equal societies will be higher. Again, remember this part doesn't matter. And most of all, it will mean that the share of females and share of males will be the same in the um, in the society, again, because X is equally distributed. However, we know from the previous research that uh, X might not be equally distributed across genders, and it might be for several reasons, for example, uh, financial literacy, human capital, but the most standard one is risk aversion. Females are more risk averse than men. That means that in expectation, females will have lower risky share and has lower returns. What does it mean? It means that if we introduce the um, return uh, risk return trade-off in the model and uh, the fact that females are more risk averse, then of course, depending on the beta, more equal societies might generate, first of all, optimally low returns. And second, uh, there might be more males as household heads simply because males are able to achieve high returns because of their risk preferences. And I think what is important, and of course, uh, and, 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 and when we introduce this very standard feature in the model, uh, so when we deviate from the linear utility and introduce, let's say, uh, CRA utility, the uh, empirical prediction, the theoretical prediction from this model uh, will be at odds with empirical finding that the authors have in the paper. And I think it will be important to reconcile the, the theoretical predictions once the risk aversion is featured and, and what the uh, authors find uh, empirically. So my second set of comments will be related to uh, uh, the measure of social norms. So remember what the social norms is. The, uh, by the social norms, we want to uh, measure the uh, uh, probability that a female can become a household head. So I think the authors do it very creatively, and in particular, as Lana explained, they condition on the individual characteristics and estimate the um, cohort uh, region fixed effect. So let me illustrate it. So I, I, I took the data that uh, I, uh, the, the author used, and, and here, for uh, to give you an example, I plotted the uh, share of females in the two regions and in the two cohorts. And in particular, I took the uh, first cohorts in 1924 for the Northeast and for the islands. And here you see that the probability uh, for a female to be household head is very low. And uh, I took the youngest cohort, 69, again for the North system for the islands. And it turns out that uh, especially in the islands, the probability of females to be household head is, is much higher. So what is the uh, cohort by region fixed effect? It is um, a weighted average, weighted by the number of observation in each survey year, a weighted average across all survey years. So what might be a little bit puzzling here is that we don't normally think of the islands as uh, I think about Sicily and Sardinia as more equal societies. So how come um, they, are, they uh, turn out in the data to be more equal? And it could be because, for example, we are also uh, estimating the betas. So um, if we also estimate here the preference for conformity, uh, then uh, that will um, result in the fixed effects you estimate. So for example, if Northeast is more uh, low obedience, so to say, than the islands, that would will show up in the fixed effects uh, we estimate. So I think it will be worthwhile to think further how to disentangle the preference for conformity and the social norms per se. So my second worry with, uh, with the measure of social norms is the possibility of omitted uh, variable bias. And so to give you the, uh, to illustrate it, let me plot uh, the number of observations in each survey, uh, in each survey for the uh, youngest cohorts for the Northeast and for the islands. What is surprising here is that uh, when uh, North, East, and Islands uh, respondents are in their early 20s. The number of observations is exactly the same in both regions. As individuals age and approach their 30s, uh, the number of observations in Islands increase much less than the number of observations in the Northeast. So what might be going on? Well, we know that in Italy there is a migration from the South to the North. 
And the individuals who might have migrated might be very differently from the individuals who might have stayed, which might affect both the gender of the headship and the participation. How? Let me give you an example. Imagine that the uh, individuals who decided to stay in the South uh, are heirs and are expected to, uh, for example, receive a large inheritance. They're most likely to stay, they're more likely to be uh, household heads, but they're more likely to participate, not because the female uh, the society is more equal, but simply because they're richer. And, and, and there might be other examples of that. So I think uh, it would be very useful to think how we can further think about exogenous variation in the social norms. My third concern with the uh, measure of social norms is a potential spurious correlation. So remember uh, uh, how the um, uh, social norms are measured. It is an average of the probability to be a female uh, household head average across survey years. In a similar way, of course, the participation rate is measured. Now, how the observations across cohorts are distributed across uh, survey years, well, it turns out they're not equally distributed. And in particular, all the cohorts are overrepresented in the between 2010 and 2015, whereas all the cohorts are primarily uh, are represented in the early 90s, simply because they're too old to be observed in the 2015. What does it mean? It means that if for some reason, there was something that affected uh, the uh, participation rate uh, over time uh, that would disproportionately affect the participation rate, uh, the, the participation rate on cohorts. So think about if the participation cost decreased over time, that would mean that the older cohorts will have lower participation rate, whereas younger cohorts will have high participation rate. And that has nothing to do with the social norms uh, estimated from the probability to be a household head. Now, my, my next set of comments is related to the uh, measure of uh, returns. And, and, and in particular, I have two comments here. So the authors use two measure of returns. The first is financial returns. So what do you want ideally? You want yearly expected returns. Due to the data limitation to this survey, uh, um, the authors can measure the following ratio uh, and the ratio between the realized income from financial assets over the financial assets. What is an issue? The issue is we don't observe the holding period. And let me uh, uh, show you example why it matters. Imagine the person who invested $100 in 1990 and the yearly return of 1%. He realized uh, his income in 2010 after 20 years uh, holding period. What would be the returns that the authors estimate from their measure because of compound it will be 18% at an actual yearly return of 1%. Now think about another investor who uh, also realized uh, his uh, capital income in 2010, but he invested in 2009, so only one year holding period, now at 10% instead of 1% yearly return. So the returns the authors estimate will be 9% versus the actual 10% of the yearly returns. So now why does it matter? Well, it matters that it, because uh, returns uh, uh, exponentially increasing with the holding period, but we also know that the holding period depends on the gender. In particular, in, 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 in his paper, Terence, uh, who, who was a panelist uh, yesterday, um, one of the keynote speaker showed that uh, women, are le uh, women are, uh, tend to have longer holding periods, which means that this measure of returns will mechanically generate higher returns for, for women, which again might uh, drive some of the results. Uh, the second measure of the returns is the total net returns. So what we want ideally here is expected returns on net wealth. Um, uh, however, what the authors do, they take the uh, cap uh, net capital income and divide it by the total assets. So what could be the issue here? The issue that we might uh, neglect the leverage effect. 
let again let me illustrate it let's take investor f and m uh, investor f has no leverage so his implied returns are exactly the same as actual returns and in particular capital income divided by the level of total assets uh, 10 over 100 is 10 percent whereas if you take an uh, investor who is levered and now he's uh, he also on top of the capital income has five of interest paid but also 50 of that it will turn out that his actual returns are 10 percent whereas the returns that the authors estimate is just five because we do not take into account leverage why it's an issue again it is an issue because we will underestimate the returns for more leveraged individuals and we know from the previous research that it will be males and yet again this measure would artificially generate high returns for women who are less levered now i have a comment on the diversification but luana uh, uh, didn't have time to talk about it so uh, let me just uh, uh, give one more comment on the uh, evolution of female headship and why there was a shift. Um, so the uh, explanation uh, to this sharp shift that the authors gave in the paper was the change in the pension reform. However, I think uh, that should be taken with a caution and the reason for this is the following. Before 91, uh, the survey explicitly uh, defined the household head as a person who would be normally considered household head, for example, husband or father. So this is the actual wording of the questionnaire. Now, starting in 91, the household head and the reference person is defined as a person responsible for household economy or, or the most informed about one. So in fact, this, uh, um, I do not think that it matters much for the main analysis because the main analysis is conducted from 91 onwards, but it however illustrates how sensitive the uh, evolution of the female headship is to the definition of, of the household head. And it also might uh, affect the intuition behind the reform, uh, pension reform analysis. So let me uh, conclude and uh, let me conclude by saying that I think it is a very interesting question. I think it is very interesting to think about the um, decision within the household uh, in terms of efficiency and uh, um, uh, think about who uh, the gender uh, division of, uh, of labor in terms of efficiency. And I think the paper is very creative in terms of empirical design. But I think uh, it would, the paper would really benefit from thinking further about how we can actually pin down the social norms channel. And also because of the drawbacks of how returns are measured, I would really focus more on the participation, which is much, much more clean. And I really forward, look forward for, for, the, for the next version. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, so let's see if we have any question from the audience. Um, so in that case, uh, or while we wait, I let Luana to, uh, to respond. Yeah, um, thank you so much for all of the uh, very well taken uh, uh, comments. Uh, um, I will I will go in a, like random order, but uh, um, I guess one thing that it's really uh, important that you pointed out was this idea of risk aversion, and that's exactly what I would have expected, right? When when women start participating more into financial decision making, <laughs> you see obviously portfolios changing in terms of being more conservative. Um, now, how that, like, obviously, as, as I showed that we do not see that, we see, in fact, we do see the opposite. Now, how do, how do I reconcile that? And, and remember that in, in, uh, like in one of the regression, we also have the dummy variable for whether the gender, uh, like the household that is indeed the woman, and it doesn't matter. It would have mattered if it was like really like risk aversion, personal individual risk aversion mattered, and effectively Italian women are more risk averse than men which probably is true. Uh, the only point that I can make here is that really like investment, these investment decisions are, are joint. Uh, and therefore, although it is true that the women might be more risk averse, it is also true that this, this, uh, this risk aversion may be sort of uh, 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 less important in joint decisions. So typically when, when, uh, when, uh, when you make decisions in a team rather than as an individual, your risk aversion will be lower. 
um, typical. That's experimental evidence. So that's uh, that's why, yeah. And I think I should have mentioned. I should have mentioned that in the in the paper. But I agree that's puzzling. As far as immigration goes, we do also have controls for, for example, whether the cap both of the of the spouses were born in the region uh, of residence. So to control for this idea of, uh, of, uh, of immigration, and, uh, but the results do not really uh, change much. So um, there was, uh, uh, the, there was uh, something about the returns. Yeah, I agree, totally agree. The measure of returns is not, uh, is not a perfect uh, measure, but I don't think that we can do much uh, about that. Like as we, uh, many of you know, <laughs> the, the, that, that's, uh, I guess that's the best thing you can do with, uh, with Italian data. Um, as, far as, as for the spurious correlation, uh, that's uh, definitely um, um, a good point, and that's why so we add uh, uh, you know year fixed effect in order to avoid like a, uh, uh, picking up sort of uh, effects that are due to the to the timing of the of the uh, of the survey rather than uh, um, rather than like propensity to invest or, or not, and we also. Uh, add and subtract and, and, and exclude the sample uh, of, uh, of older people, so whoever is older than uh, whoever is older than 65, precisely in order to take care of those uh, uh, of those uh, uh, um, of those issues. And I leave you with uh, with one last comment, which is, as many of you know, my co-author is from Sardinia, which turns out to be the the most progressive uh, region. And it turns out that there's actually literature in the, um, in the uh, anthro um, Italian anthropological uh, studies that say that, uh, that effectively Sardinian women uh, are more um, sort of emancipated for, a re for the reason that you, the, 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 the Sardinian, is a, a Sardinian economy is based on, on uh, 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 shepherding. So uh, it's a pastoral economy. So the men are away from home for a long time, and and they leave women at home dealing with day to day sort of managing of their assets. Um, so that can be an explanation. But really, I we looked uh, high and low for some sort of a more sociological anthropological explanation for differences in regions, uh, which as Italians uh, are very interesting to us. But um, we didn't want to push on on this. Uh, uh, sort of um, um, explanations uh, too much. Probably it's not of interest for for most of the audience. Um, thank you very much. Anyways, Anastasia, and, uh, like, please send over your slides. It's a very you so precious. Much. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for the first two papers. So, so we're going to take five minutes break.